warm welcome to you all. Very warm welcome. And I'm sure you will uh, be, uh, for want of a better word, blessed by coming today. And um, hopefully at five o'clock, when we've finished this presentation, you will have a good understanding of what I call the holy science. Uh, the holy science consists of astrology and astrotheology, mostly. Okay? Now, astrotheology is kicking around a bit lately. It has been for thousands of years, but it's been persecuted. So people don't know the characters. When they read about Jesus in the Bible, or, or Humpty Dumpty, for that matter, um, in the nursery rhymes, Little Red Riding Hood, they don't know who the characters are. We've lost the science. All the characters are the same people, the same entities. Those entities are always the most uh, fundamental um, objects of the solar system. They are the characters. The characters that turn up in every myth, every legend, and every nursery rhyme, <clears throat> and every great Bible or gospel, there they are. There's Helios. That's the Egyptians called Helios Atum. We call it Atom. Same word. Because it is an atom. An atom has... A, an electric light core and then it has magnetic bodies called electrons floating around it. As you will see in the, in the myths of the Greeks and in the Bible, these characters always turn up. The main characters are always the sun and the moon which goes around our earth. The moon is not there. You can't see that floating around the earth but it, remember it's not in this picture, but it's there, and it's one of the seven. They are the seven orbs in the sky that our eyes can see, the components of our atom. In Egypt, these were called the cosmocrators. This is the demiurge. When Christians talk about their God, it's, it's this God, the maker, the former of physical bodies. It's not the Ein Sof the prime source, the prime creator, which dwells in the ether, which has no definition. We just cannot describe this one. We know that God is love. Um, we know that God is light. That's what the Bible says anyway, if we're looking at what the ancient traditions say. Well, there it is. There are four scriptures in the Bible that define God. And one of them is <clears throat> Psalm 84.11. And it says, For the Lord God is a sun, S-U-N, and a shield. I'll show you what that means later because there's a shield protecting our earth called the magnetosphere. That's the earth, that's the sun, and these are mass coronial ejections. Now these solar flares will strip the atmosphere of the earth in an instant if this magnetosphere did not exist. So when the, in Psalm 84, 11, when it says the Lord God is a sun and a shield, that's what it's talking about. Because the Lord God is a sun, not the prime creator, the demiurge. Okay, so when I talk about God, <coughs> um, there's the twofold definition there. Remember that there's the Ein Sof, the ether, and these formators. And how do they form our bodies? Well, our, the magnificent shapes that uh, in the sky, geometric patterns that these plat patterns that these planets um, 
design in the sky, they're beautiful. They're just magic. These, for instance, I'll just give you one example. There's the Earth and Saturn. You will see 30 rings because it takes 30 years for Saturn to go around the Earth, around the Sun. So you'll see 30 rings there around that one ring, right? Because every time, as Saturn takes 30 years to go around the Sun, it does all these retrogressions and it does all these circles. There's 30 of them. Those patterns and all the other planets that are doing the same thing, these are just a few examples, by the way, just a few of the geometric forms that are sustaining our bodies and uh, giving them form and keeping them in form. It is. Beautiful geometric patterns that keep us sustained. And what happens, the result is these seven, these seven energies that are in our body. They come from the seven planets. Moon, Mercury, Venus, Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. And it's from the rings of Saturn when we burst the crown chakra. As we transmute our lead into gold, and we open up these chakras, these wheels, everything's wheels. As we do that <coughs> and we climb from the base is the earth where, we're, where our physical bodies are. And as we climb up and, and, and activate these chakras, you'll find that the, the purpose that of humanity being on the earth is to activate these seven powers. When we are clothed in these uh, bodies that we have, um, we are said to acquire seven vices and we are to turn those vices around into virtues, true virtues. So our love becomes unconditional and jealousy is turned into uh, uh, empathy. And when we do that and we master those things in the holy science, we return back to the heavens whence we came. The ether. These are the four elements, the platonic elements. Sorry. Right, right over there. The platonic elements, fire, air, water and earth. Um, in atomic theory, scientists know that all atoms will be, will do either this, light, gas, liquid or solid. All atoms. In fact, some of the uh, periodic tables uh, show that very, very clearly. It's not, hard to, um, it's not hard to get one of these on the internet. There you have your uh, solids, right, the blue. There's your liquid, the orange, and there's your gas. So when they were talking about these... Uh, <coughs> Elements, they were talking about science. Now, they also correspond with the five platonic solids. Are we all familiar with the platonic solids or the Pythagorean solids? Pythagorean solids? Okay. These are the solids. <coughs> Those five shapes are the platonic solids. These are the only five shapes that will fit inside a sphere and they will touch at the corners, at the edges. So there's the tetrahedron, has four sides, tetra meaning four. Octa is eight, icoso is twenty, hexa is six, and dodeca, that's a Greek word, for two and ten, twelve. So we have We have four sides, that's fire. That corresponds with fire. So these are the light photons. Hex, carbon, corresponds with carbon. By the way, at the outer there, I've got, uh, I've got all the four elements that um, make up 90% of our bodies. Okay, and they correspond. These are perfect correspondences. And as they come down from the ether, they get grosser 
and grosser. Okay? Just bear that in mind. So these five platonic solids are how atoms will, um, will act and behave and shape themselves. They will be either solid, fiery, radiant, <coughs> gas, that's the octa, it's got eight, eight sides, and icosa, water. Interesting, 20 sides for water. Right, and there's your dodecahedron, the ether. And that commands all of them, as you will see. All right? Now, <clears throat> these characters keep turning up. Abraham and Sarah, sun and the moon. Jesus and Mary Magdalene, sun and the moon. King Arthur and Guinevere, sun and the moon. And you, usually the, the hero has his three or four close men by him. That's Mars, Jupiter and, and Saturn because the sun is the lord of them all. In the Greek myths, that's Helios, that's Hermes, Aphrodite, Venus. Mars is Ares, that's Zeus, the god of thunder. He's the boss and he overtook Kronos, Saturn, as the boss. He's been ruling in the age of Pisces for 2,000 years. Jupiter. The Jews know him as Jehovah. The Catholic Church calls him Peter. Jew Peter. So the Church of Peter at Rome is the Church of Jupiter. But don't be confused because it's also the Church of Christ. And I'll show you that. That's Christ. And it's also the Church of Saturn. Okay? They've done this deliberately. They say they're Christian. It's not Christian. It's a Saturnian church. Hot. He's the hottest boy <laughs> in the solar system. He's the coldest of the seven that we see. Okay? So there's this, they are considered as twin brothers, Jesus and Satan. Saturn is Satan. And its church is the Latin church, the church of Saturn. That's why they wear black. It's the Grim Reaper. This fellow here, <clears throat> Saturn, there's actually a hex. This is a true picture of Saturn, people. There's a hex on top of Saturn. It's a gas, it's a gas giant. It's, it's made of hydrogen and helium, just like the sun. That's a hex. And he's the grim, the grim Reaper. So, as you will see later, you'll see how all this comes about and how it uh, makes, starts to make sense. Um, but everywhere you will see these characters. And this hero, of course he's the hero, because without this sun in the solar system, we get to perish in an instant. He's our saviour. And as the Bible says... Um, he is coming in the clouds. Every eye will see him. I am the light of the world. And those four scriptures that describe God in the Bible, God is love, John 4, 8. God is light. Well, I wonder whether they knew what they were talking about when they said that. God is a blazing fire in Hebrews wonder what they were talking about when they said that and how many Christians think about that. God is a blazing fire in the Bible and the scripture I just read to you from Psalms that the Lord God is a sun and a shield. So as we see I'm going to uh, show how all the fairy tales, all of them, all the nursery rhymes, all the legends, whether you've read the uh, Ovid's Metamorphosis or the Iliad, or the Odyssey, or the Ennead, or Shakespeare, or Dante, or you can recall any of those nursery rhymes and those beautiful fairy tales at school when you were a little child growing up, Jack and the Beanstalk, Little Red Riding Hood, Cinderella. What do they mean? Well, we're going to learn the science of what it means. 
and they're all based on the nat natural cycles of nature. Everything. They're all based on the natural cycles of nature, which is basically our true religion. Now, true religion? Religion has had a war for the last few thousand years against Science, has it not? There's always been this war. And um, <clears throat> the religionists have persecuted many, many scientists. Under religion we have theology. Under science we have philosophy. Theology has been at war with philosophy and the philosophers, Plato, Hermes, Plutarch, Seneca was killed, had to eat the poison, Nero's philosopher, who's basically the founder of Christianity. You read anything of, of Seneca's and you'll find it absolutely perfectly harmonises with anything that Jesus ever said. Because as I will show you that the words that were put into Jesus' mouth come straight from the philosophers, straight from Plato and straight from Hermes. They're rip-offs. Not, they're not false. We, we just haven't been told where this wisdom really comes from. The Bible is, is a book of, it's, it's full of treasures. But for the fool who takes it literally, and even the Jews say in their books, I can show you some quotes and I will, that if you look at these stories of ours, and as absurd as they are, and you treat them literally, you're a monkey. Because it's science. The Bible is there to enslave fools and to enlighten the wise ones. It really is. And you'll see that. Love of wisdom. Why wouldn't you love wisdom? Sophia is a goddess. Theos is a god. It's male and female. We're talking about the right brain, the left brain persecuting the right brain. The left brain's a tyrant, it's male. It's connected to the five senses. This is the five sense religion, theology. This is how it is. They give you dogma and doctrine. Over here we study, we learn, we observe science. Because under philosophy there's three branches. There is logic, there is ethics, and there is physics, science, science, science. It's all science. It's all learning. It's all understanding the world, how it is. Those boys over there have counterfeited these three and given us, sorry to turn my back on you, morals, Ignorance, fear and superstition come here. They prefer you feed on ignorance, fear and superstition. And we'll give you some morals. We'll make them up and we'll shove them down your throat. Don't worry about your own ethics. Don't worry about your, your goodness and your path back to God. Forget about that. Just believe and you'll be saved. We'll have a vicarious salvation. Right? That's what the churches are offering. They're saying to you, just believe in our doctrine, don't question, and one day you're just going to get saved because you've believed. Don't worry about your alcohol problem and your whatever, anger problem, and the fact that you commit other crimes. Just come to church and believe. Uh, so morals and uh, doctrine. That's how it works. That's how it works, guys. <clears throat> Here, how do I know the world? How is the world made? The world being what it is, how do I live in it in order to secure happiness? Apart from that, you don't need to know anything. 
What else is there to, what else is there to know? <laughs> Excuse me. All right? Here, they tell you, this is the dogma. This is the doctrine. You follow it. Otherwise, you'll go to hell. And ignorance, well, they're the people who tried to kill Galileo. They, they killed Giordano Bruno. Giordano Bruno died 30 years before Galileo. Pe people don't even know that. He was saying the same thing. There are three things that are outstanding about what Giordano Bruno died for on the, on, in the year 1600 in Rome. Seven years he was being uh, questioned in the Inquisition. And he's written a lot of books, some of which I've read. And they're very, very powerful. And they're teaching the same thing as I'm going to teach you today. Philosophy, all of this, truth, verifiable facts. Three things that Giordano Bruno said was if we don't go back to the religion of Egypt and the Catholic Church has been persecuting that religion, true Christianity, for thousands of years. And I'll show you that Christianity was based, it was a worldwide religion based on nature, based on this. And they've perverted it and corrupted it and dished it out in a vomitous fashion where you can go down to the local priest anywhere in any of these churches and you're sure that your children will not be protected from pedophiles. I guarantee you there's no protection there because they run a system of horror and terror and they're behind the war on terror right now, believe me. But this is coming back. It's coming back fast and ferociously because we are waking up the true science. Giordano Bruno said that in 1600. They pulled his tongue out. The day they burned him, they stripped him naked. They pulled his tongue out and put a device there and a nail through it so that he could not talk to the crowds at Piazza dei Fiori in Rome. There's a statue there today. And people on the 17th of February every year pay tribute to Giordano Bruno. Get on YouTube, get on the internet and study what he said. The other thing he said was that there's many, many, many inhabited planets in the universe. And the other thing he said that stood out from what I've read is that the Bible is not to be taken literally. Okay? So we're coming around again. All the Renaissance masters were teaching that. All of them. So it's handy to read some of those Renaissance masters to see what they were thinking because the... Um, the Christians were quick to retaliate to that awakening that was happening. Started in, in Florence and then spread all around Europe. Beautiful wisdom. Then came the, what the, well, the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation, the Thirty Year War. And they did manage, they succeeded to stifle the truth once more. But this time, it ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen. It's out of control now and people are leaving the churches in their droves because they're not being satisfied. Because they're not being satisfied by giving truth, true information. Okay, so um, what I want to establish is let's get to know the solar system. Because it's in the knowledge of the solar system that we understand the cycles that will teach us all the wisdom that we need. There are three fundamental motions of the solar system. The day, the year and the great year or what's known as again the platonic year because of Plato's work and how he enlightened the West with regard to this beautiful cycle which lasts about 25,000 years. Okay? We're coming to the end of that cycle on the 21st of December 2012. We're coming to what's called the, an equinoctial crossing. So what I'm going to be teaching now is I'm going to be teaching about the day, the year and the great year. The great year I'm going to be using a figure of 24,000 years. It, that's exactly how long it takes in fact. That's 24,000 years, just like the 24 hours you have on your clock. Because it comes from that. Because the ancients knew that we lived in this great wheel. And how did they know that we lived in this great wheel? Well, it's simple. 
Um, east is that way, there's west. Okay? I'm just going to turn it around a little bit so that you can see me pointing over here to the east and over there to the west. Okay? Now, when the sun rises in the east, it always rises in a 17 degree belt called the zodiac. The zodiac. That's how wide it is, and it's 30 degrees long. So the sun will always be, it's in Taurus at the moment, right? It's the uh, 15th of May, so it's, it's, it'll be in Taurus for another five days. But it's always in this belt, and it's called Aphrodite's belt. In the Bible, it's called the Maseroth. But it's the zodiac, <clears throat> because the sun never leaves that belt. It's always there. When it rises this morning, you, if you could see the stars behind it, you'll see the bull. Okay? Even though there's been some processional slippage, and it's not, it's not exactly the bull, it's, it's Aries. If you look up and you go, hang on, the sun's in Aries. It's not in Taurus. Why do they say it's in Aries? Well, because it's... it's slipped out 30 degrees. <clears throat> With the zodiacal wheel, twelve signs of the zodiac here, um, if you have Aries here and then Taurus here, the Sun's actually here, it's not in Taurus. Because There's Pisces and there's Aquarius. We know we're going to, into the age of Aquarius. We've been in the age of Pisces for 2,000 years. Before that, it was 2,000 years of, Mar of Aries. Before that, it was 2,000 years of Taurus in the Egyptian days. Because we're going backwards. We are going backwards through the 12 signs and, we, and the sun is, stays in there for 2,000 years until it does a full circle and that's 24,000 year great year. Now, when we, when we look to the east, we see the sun rises in the east, sets in the west. The stars are doing the same thing. The zodiacal constellations are coming up in the east and they go around and they set in the west. And so do the beautiful, so does the moon, and so do the five visible planets. Have you seen them this morning? Did you see the, the, the there's a beautiful... Uh, there's a magnificent um, conjunction at the moment in Aries. There's Mars, four of, the vi four of the visible planets, and Uranus, which you can't see, are all in Aries. It's beautiful. If, you, if there's no clouds tomorrow morning, I, I suggest you wake up because there's a pyramid in the sky. Oh. Yeah, it's like this. It's like uh, Mars, uh, Mercury, Venus, and Jupiter. And, of course, Venus and Jupiter are so luminous, and you'll see it in the east. Beautiful. Yes. And setting directly opposite in Libra is Saturn. I guarantee you that this is a war in heaven that is in all of our Bibles. I haven't had time to research it yet, but this is, this is the big conjunction. Because in three months we're going to get a visit by, by a very large celestial body called Elenin. And around about September the 5th, all the way to the 22nd of November... And the 22nd of November is a very powerful date. It's the one and only day of the year in which our sun passes through the centre of the Milky Way galaxy. It does it every year. In between Scorpio's arrow and Sag uh, Sagittarius's arrow and Scorpio's tail. The 22nd of every month is powerful because it's the handover day when one sign hands over to the next, when Taurus hands over to Gemini. It happens on May the 22nd. And then June the 22nd is the same thing. All of these, all of these 21st and 22nds coming up are, are going to be very, very powerful, starting from this May. Because May the 21st 
is the opposite of November the 21st. And they are both days, two both days when the sun goes through the galactic plane every year. I'll explain that later. I'll explain that because that's very important. This is an amazing alignment. It's, it's amazing that Saturn should be in Libra, which is the sign of its exaltation, if you know your astrology. So Saturn's very happy right now in Libra. Looks beautiful. In fact, if you look up, you'll see it's in Virgo, next door. So I'm looking at the Holy Virgin in the sky, and there's Saturn. It's beautiful. But really, it's in Libra. I'll explain this later. You have to understand this. The science is still all good and calibrated, regardless of that 30 degrees of slippage. We need not pay any attention to that, and I'll explain why. Okay? Um, <clears throat> but the day gives us night and day, night and darkness. And there already you see the enemies of mankind, night. The night has always been an enemy of mankind. The year is divided between two polarities of summer and winter. Winter has always been an enemy of mankind. That's when you die. It's cold. Most people die in winter in extreme weathers, lack of food, didn't put enough bread in the pantry, the house is covered in snow and it's there for three months and you've only got a chimney to breathe with, a little bit of wood to keep you warm and some bread in the pantry, a bit of olive oil, All right, winter's a killer. These are the two enemies and here we have, a, we also have, we go from the golden age to the silver age to the bronze age to the to the Iron Age, the four ages. And I'll explain, this is beautiful. How do we get to the Golden Age? How come we've been in the, in the, bron in the uh, Iron Age? How come? Well, we're going to know that. You're going you're to have that explained. But you, we, we need to focus on these three. By knowing these three cycles and only these three fundamental cycles, you will understand everything that's about to come that I'm going to show you. So this is quite easy to understand. <clears throat> the day obviously is ruled by the god of day, that's the sun. As Plato said, we need a third thing in order for our sense of sight to be activated. They can't be activated without the sun. All the other senses don't need the sun. They don't need a third thing was Plato's argument to Socrates. So this god of day, the sun, day comes from the word deis, god, in Latin. Year comes from, also comes from the name of the sun. Do you know how? You see the word yeah there? Well, it comes from the word yes, which comes from the word yes, which is the sun. Is that, um, I think Yahweh, is it that they understand that they we strike by the name of Yahweh? Is that what comes in Yes, it does. Yeah. Yes. Yahweh, Jehovah. Yeah. But <coughs> Jesus is specifically... That's the name of the sun, just like the moon is called Luna. It's funny how people have not been taught to name the sun. The sun, it's got a name. In Hebrew, it's Michael or Emmanuel. In India, it's Krishna, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. In Egypt, it was Osiris, Set, Atum, Amun, Horus, Ra. I'll show you that, and I'll show you that the the sun will, will have a different name depending on where it is around the 24-hour clock. When the sun is directly above you at 12 o'clock, it's Ra. When it's rising, it's Horus. When it's setting, it's Set. When it's below your feet at midnight, it's Osiris in the tomb, the black tomb of Saturn. So we'll, we'll get to that. How do we know that the sun is yes? Well, they tell you. You just have to look. You can Google those images. Google the image for the sun. 
and you'll see the word yes. I-E-S. This is Greek. That is eta in Greek. It's an E. Yes. There's the Pope with the yes. And when we say yes and we nod our heads, we nod our heads because the sun rises and it sets and it's positive affirmation. Yes. It's the word for the sun. That's it. There's the yes. He's always been called yes. In fact, in, Egypt, in um, India, they call him yes Krishna. And that's when Constantine adopted this name for their new god, the Mithraic god of the sun. He said, we shall call him yes Krishna. Jesus Christ in the Latin equivalent. There's the yes on the cross. It's the sun. So they tell you this. There's the Jehovah's Witness magazine, The Watchtower. You've seen that, haven't you? Jehovah, the one who is vigorous in power. What symbol? The sun. Believe you me, the governing body of the Jehovah's Witnesses know exactly what they're doing. They know exactly what they're doing. <clears throat> Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Just, just as the moon gives us the month, so does the God give us the day. Because the day comes from the word dio, dios in Latin. So it's the God of day. And year, the year, comes from yes, yes, the sun. Minute comes from the moon. Hour comes from just switch those two letters around. That's all you've got to do. What hour is it? In other words, where is Horace? Where is Horace right now? What hour is it? Okay, so <clears throat> what I'd like to do now is explain to you this great year because you're so familiar with this. It's not too hard. You get four, two seasons that are divided into four, summer, autumn, winter and spring. And the same thing's happening here, by the way. People don't realise we've got quarters. We've got morning, afternoon, evening, night. We do. It's all in halves or quarters. Just adapt to looking at, at these in day and night or quarters, summer and winter or four seasons, and the four seasons here, the golden age, because that's exactly how it works. And the good news is we're coming out of that dark age. After 2012, big, big, wonderful things are going to happen, especially for the ones who are ready. Now, a lot of people um, are concerned about this readiness. And I will go into that later because, you know, you don't have to be a great guru and you don't have to be one of these people who can walk on fire and perform miracles and wonder workers. It's, it's love. It's just all about love. <laughs> mm, real love. True love. This world has corrupted the whole concept of love and families and communities. They've perverted it. It's a corporate monstrosity. And it comes from think tanks like the Club of Rome and Bilderbergers and the Trilateralists and all these absolute insane putrid minds. And they're dishing this out. You look around in society, you've got McDonald's and, and you've got all this just corporate shit. It's gone, to, it's gone to poo. But we can see that. And that's what's our salvation. We've been saved from that world. People believe in that world. They believe, oh, Osama bin Laden, let's retaliate and let's, and the war in Libya. And they believe in it. That's just, it's, it's just theatre. It's not happening. It's not happening at all. It's just their world that they're trying to control because they're losing grips of their world because people are waking up. 
and Goliath is about to be slain and they know it. And we're getting help from all over the universe to fight this evil enemy. It's been around for about three and a half thousand years since the days of Akhenaten. I'll go back to, into the history of that. Uh, but we will be victorious. Okay, so there's no need to fear. There's nothing to fear. Not even Elenin that's coming. And it's coming. It's going to be going through the sun and the earth at 0.2 astronomical units, which is very, 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 very close. And it's going to be going straight past the path of the earth and we're going to be going right through the tail of it by November this year. That's how close it is. Now, if you send me an email, I'll send you a link where you can see this. There's a 10-minute video thing getting around and I can email that to you so you can, uh, and you can see it. You can see that the graph that the scientists have, have written, drawn, drawn out. There's the sun. Elenin's coming through here. We've got Mercury. We've got Venus. We've got the Earth. And it's coming in like this, and it's going to go in like that. Here's the Earth. And it's going to go straight past out again, and we're going to go through this tail. We're going to go through the tail at 0.2 astronomical units. What's an astronomical unit? It's the distance from the Earth to the Sun, 92 million miles. That's one astronomical unit. At the moment, Elenin is two astronomical units away from us. And it's coming quick. In three months, it will be here. That's Nibiru. We're talking about Nibiru here. Is that the, sun, is that the second sun that you can see in the sky? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And we're going to go through that tail. But nothing, nothing should ever allow you to fear. Okay? There's some scary stuff, but it's scary for them. It's scary for the people who haven't woken because they're in for a rude awakening. It's going to bite them in the, on the, the bum <laughs> for not paying attention. We'll play that video on Sorry? I'll play that video on Sorry? Yeah. What authority have you got to say that what you're seeing in that video is real? Yes. 15 minutes, 15 minutes for tape change. Okay. Okay, let's have a look at this um, 24,000 24, year cycle. We need to just spend 10 minutes on that, then I'm going to get into the good stuff, all right? This is a book that I'm going to be using for all the next 10 minutes, 15 minutes of graphs. This is Walter Crittenden, Lost Star of Myth and Time. It's basically about our sun being in a binary. Our sun is in a binary with Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, 8.4 light years away. There are other closer stars, and usually when you, even Walter says, when you suggest that Sirius is the one that is in, with our sun as a binary, usually people tend to say, well, what about, um, there are many more stars that are closer, but... As you will see, I'm going to give you some proofs that we are in a binary with Sirius. Now, how he describes the binary, in the beautiful little picture here, which I will draw on the board for you, uh, we have a binary with Sirius, and it goes something like this. There's Earth, there's Sirius. Okay? And they go around this way. Oh, sorry. The sun. Thank you very much. There's our sun, Jesus. There's Sirius, which is Isis. That's Isis. And scientists know that our sun comes from Sirius. Um... <coughs> Sorry? No, Nibiru comes around every 3,600 years. Right? So it's, it's different uh, harmonic, but it, it's related to all of this. Um, just a little bit about Sirius. Our entire solar system with all its planets and moon, describes a huge circle around another sun in space, viz. the star Sirius. Now I'm reading from 
George R. Goodman, who wrote this in The Age of Reason, an article in The Free Thinker, uh, probably about 40 or 50 years ago, I don't know, but it's early 1900s. This movement takes 25,920 years. That's the figure you'll hear mostly for procession for the great year. 25,920. Walter Crutenden's using the 24,000 years just like I'm going to be. I'm using that figure, 24,000 years, not the 25,000. Okay? And I'll explain why there's a difference. This movement takes 25,000 years to complete and during that time our sun appears to traverse through the various constellations or star clusters. This was already known to the ancient from China to Mexico and from Babylon to Egypt. Okay, so Sirius is the star that is mentioned there. Um, <clears throat> our sun was thrown off from another sun, Sirius, doesn't mention it here, but it is serious. <laughs> uh, around which it revolves, taking 25,827 years to perform its cycle of the year. And the person who wrote that, Albert Churchwood, in the 1800s. Now, <clears throat> what happens is they go around each other clockwise. And it takes 24,000 years to do one circle, okay? When we come close to each other like this, we're in the golden age. So it's a long time. It's about a good solid 10,000 years the golden age lasts. Then we start going to what's called the silver age because of the distance now. There's more distance, you see? They're parting from each other and they're saying goodbye. Bronze age. Dark Age. Simple as that. You can see that. That's quite clear to understand. Here's one fact that proves that we're in a binary that Walter Crutten, Crutenden presents. And that is the fact that Sirius, now a bright blue star, 2,000 years ago, was red. This is an amazing fact. When I tell that to people, usually they, they just don't grasp how important that fact is. Sirius has changed colours. Now again, in this folder that I have about Sirius, I've got, that's Aratus, the most 300 years BC. This is 2300 years old, this poem. One of the first poems dealing with the, um, dealing with the uh, movement of the suns the, uh, and the planets and the zodiac and everything. It's beautiful. In here, he says, Sirius is red. That's 2,300 years ago. We know it's blue. I've got, so that's Aratus. I've got Marcus Manilius, the astronomer to Caesar Augustus. Astronom Astronomica, one of the most beautiful poems that will teach you, most of what I'm t teaching you comes out of Marcus Manilius here today, that poem. Five books called the Astronomica. In there he says, in there he says, now get this, he's the first one that de describes it as blue. Talking about Sirius, he says, hardly is it inferior to the sun, save that its abode is far away and beams, the beams it launches forth from its sea blue face are cold. Um, now, and I've got Horus, first century Horus, saying it's red. Seneca, red. And Ptolemy, red. So what's this, um, this, how do we resolve this matter? How do we understand what happened with Sirius 2,000 years ago? Well, it was exactly 2,000 years ago that that Sirius turned blue because when, let's say this is our Earth, okay, uh, our Sun, and this is Sirius, and they're moving away from each other. Moving away is the Doppler effect called 
red shifted. So those bodies that are red, red shifted, are moving away from us. Blue is coming towards. So Sirius must have, 2,000 years ago when it changed colour, it must have turned it must have turned that corner and then started and now it's coming toward us as blue. Simple as that. Can't, it cannot be any other reason. There, there are scientists, if you get on, you, on the internet and you, and you look into this problem of Sirius turning blue, there's a lot of articles up there and you'll see how a lot of uh, mainstream consensus scientists try to write this phenomena off by saying that it must have been some sort of, uh, there must have been some uh, astronomical, um, you know, cloud dust or something around that time and it was appeared red because we could just see the red uh, refracted light coming through that cloudy stuff that was around. No, we're in a binary. And here's some other proofs that we're in a binary. Now notice I said to you that that is a, a clockwise orbit they go around each other clockwise because with our orbit around the sun, we go around the sun every 365 years in an anti-clockwise orbit. And we also rotate, our ro Earth is rotating anti-clockwise. So if we go back to those three fundamental motions of the uh, solar system, day, year, and the great year, we see that these ones are anti-clockwise, these two motions, anti-clockwise and anti-clockwise. So we do 365 of these anti-clockwise turns, rotations, as we orbit the sun 365, 365 times, right? Anti-clockwise, anti-clockwise, clockwise. Why am I stressing this? Well, all those celestial bodies, the sun, the stars, they all come up in the east and set in the west. That's because we're going around anti-clockwise. If we were going around clockwise, they would come up, the sun would rise in the west and, and the stars and the seven planets, the seven visible planets. They're called the wanderers because the stars behind them, even though Jupiter looks like a star, you look up and you see Venus, you think, oh, it looks like a star. It doesn't look like a planet. All right? But those ones are wandering because they move fast. And you can see that they call them the wanderers, whereas the fixed stars are always relatively fixed. <coughs> so every day, all those bodies come from the east and set in the west. Every year the same thing happens. The zodiac belt is always coming up from the east and every month it moves 30 degrees. Right? So all your 12 constellations are, are moving 30 degrees every month until they go around every year. The great year, all of those same stars that seem to be going, there's a river in the sky and it all goes east-west, Every day they go east-west, every year they go east-west. But in procession, all of those same stars go backward. They just precess. That's what precession means. That's why they call this, this year precession, precession of the equinoxes. Because those stars are going back every 72 years, one degree, one degree, one degree, every 72 years, the average lifespan of a human being. And then finally it comes back to the equinoctial point, which is what we're doing. That's the galactic plane. Our sun does this every 24,000 years. We are right here now. We are about to go into the northern hemisphere of the Milky Way galaxy. We've been in the south for 12,000 years and we go 12,000 years in the north. That's what, that is what's happening at 2012. The galactic plane looks something like this and our sun has been traversing that slowly for the last 15 years. We are now around about there and that's, that's what 2012 is all about. That's all it is. It's an equinoctial crossing. 
but why aren't the governments of the world preparing a great big party? This only happens once every 24,000 years. Why the silence? Why is there so much science, uh, silence about this beautiful science that is taking place right now in our lifetime? All right, so, um, so we see that the daily and the yearly motions of the stars are east-westward, but in procession, they go the other way. So that's why you have pyramids and stones like uh, Stonehenge and all these monuments that are there to monitor procession. That's why they're there. But they're also there for the day and the year. But most importantly, they're there for procession. Even the, even the, um, the measurements of the pyramid, they're all measurements that are harmonics of the 24,000 year cycle. Now someone asked me in the break, uh, why do you use 24,000? Well, when corrected, according to Walter Cruttenden, when corrected, because procession is not a constant, um, it's not a const the figure of procession, the ratio and the rate is not constant. As we get closer to our sister star in this orbit, it, it speeds up. As we come racing towards Sirius, and Sirius races towards us, it speeds up here and it goes much faster than in the outer over here. So when corrected, it reduces down to 24,000 years, even though you will see the number of 25,920. But usually it's never under 24,000 and usually it's never over 25,920. Now, the other reason why I use 24,000 is because the Hindus do. Now this is a book by Sri Yukteswar called The Holy Science. Obviously that's where I got the theme for this talk today. I'm calling it The Holy Science because that's what they called it. That's what Marcus Manilius called it. That's what you probably haven't heard of this guy, second, third century astrologer called Firmic, Firmicus Maternus. That's what he said. It's a sacred and pure science, the holiest science, the most beautiful information that you can ever, ever have. Now, what does Sri Yukteswar say in the holy science? Well, this is what the Hindus knew, and where did they get their information from? Well, we have to, begs the question, we need to ask that and, and do some research into that because uh, science doesn't tell you much about the great year. We've forgotten about it. You don't learn about it at school. You don't learn anything about it. It's just, it's creepy. It's the most important cycle that we should all, we should understand it because then we can understand how history went from good down to bad and went back up to good then went back down to bad like a yo-yo. Just like, the, look, now we've got bad weather. We had better weather in summer. Now it's light. In 12 hours it'll be dark. They're, these are the cycles. These are our cycles. We're locked into them. Locked. Just like the, the, the female is locked into the moon cycle, moon, and has a menstruation cycle. She can't escape that. Men don't have it, but women cannot escape that. It's the moon that dominates them, just like the sun dominates us and the great year dominates our spirituality. And where we're going in the, in, in, the, in the great year, the place where we're going right now is a beautiful place of enlightenment. As we go through the photon belt and we get more gamma rays from the, the, the core of the Milky Way galaxy. That's what's going on. This is what Sri Yukteswar says in the opening words of his book. We learn from oriental astronomy that moons revolve around their planets and planets turning on their axes revolve with their moons round the sun. The sun with its planets and their moons takes some star for its jewel binary. Yeah, is that right spelling? Yes. Cuz someone did ask me what does binary mean? Well, it's two. It's like the binary system in the computer. There's two stars. By the way, there's 80% of the stars that you see are, are binaries. The other 20%, well, we haven't watched them enough. 
But when we do watch them and pay attention to them, we will learn that they're all, there's no one star out there on its own. Just like our atoms must get together and form compounds and then cells or go from compounds to molecules. What's a compound? Well, H2O, H2O, hydrogen and two of oxygen makes water. And we are 75% water. So atoms like to congregate. It, it's, it's very rare, rare that an atom will just go monatomically, you know, like, or a star will just float out there on its own. They all belong to star systems. And in fact, we're not just involved in a binary. We're also involved with the stars of the Pleiades and, and in particular Alcyon. Al See, Alcyon, Pleiades, and we're also involved with Procyon, the small, the small dog. This is the big dog. Sirius is in the big dog, Canis Major. <coughs> Canis Major. Procyon is the small dog. They're the two dogs that follow Orion in the sky, the hunter, as he kills the bull, Taurus. Right, he's got his two dogs behind him. One's the small dog and Sirius is the big dog. And the reason why they call it a dog is because it dogs our star. It follows our star. It's the dog. It keeps dogging our star, following it. It takes some star for its jewel and revolves around it in about 24,000 years. Of our Earth... A celestial phenomenon which causes the backward movement of the equinoctial points around the zodiac. Just what I've said. The stars go backwards. It's a phenomena where they go backwards every 24,000 years. Now, so you, you, can, you can understand that. As, as we turn, as we orbit, it appears that the sun is rising in the east, but it's our sun rotating. I mean, sorry, our Earth rotating, that's all it is. It's the Earth we're moving. They're fixed, virtually. So we see all these bodies rising in the east and setting in the west. If we, were 20, if we could live for 24,000 years, we would actually then notice the slow backward movement of, this, of these stars, and that's how we would know that we're in this cycle, because that's a cycle. Right. I'm labouring the point and you'll see why because it's so beneficial to learn this and understand this for what's to come, the next part. Just a few more proofs that we're in a binary. The Great Pyramid. There's King's Chamber, Queen's Chamber. There's a beautiful big King's Passageway there and then it shoots off there to the Queen's Chamber and then it comes down here and there's the entrance there, there's some underground stuff going on down here, right? This is the one without the top. The all-seeing eye is supposed to sit in there. By the way, that represents ether, and this is fire, earth, air and water. Okay, ether, fire, earth, air and water. That's what the pyramid's telling you. That's the ether. It's, it's uncapped for a reason. Yeah, well, it has too, yes, but... When it's placed back on there, you will see this thing is going to come back to life very, very soon. Even the Bible talks about it. In Isaiah, it says, There will be a monument built by the Lord in the heart of Egypt, on the border of Egypt, because it is on the border. Lower Egypt, Lower Egypt was everything from where the pyramid is. There's the Nile Delta. And there's the Mediterranean. The pyramid's right there. That was Lower Egypt, this is Upper Egypt, where Thebes is down here and Luxor, and there's, here is Cairo and the pyramids on the, on the Giza Plateau. That is in the middle of the land of the Lord. It will come back to life and we will know what it was all about very soon. Are they going to physically put a cap on that? I don't know. It, it is, but something's going to happen with a cap. It's going to be found. Because it was stolen, it was removed, and it was, um, there's a lot of information about this Ben Ben and, and over the thousands of years. If you read Tony Bushby's books, he's got a book, uh, he's a Queenslander who exposes all of this 
false history that we've, we've had and explains some of these mysteries about the pyramids, Tony Bushby, and it talks about this, how it was stolen and removed. Anuis Coeptis, yeah, they put that on there. FDR put that on there because what it means is um, you've got Anuis Coeptis in Latin means announcing the conception. That was the year when the Freemasons and the, the banking system implemented its new world order because on the other side of that you've got Novo, Ordus, Secularis, the New World Order, announcing its conception. 33. In 33, we became the world, the banking system, all the countries became bankrupted, right? And we were used as collateral via our birth certificates for all their loans. So we're slaves under that system. Whilst we have a birth certificate registered, regist, regist is a king. You have given the title to your soul to the Vatican. And the people who manage that, who manage this trust, we have a trust, it's worth about $15 million. Your birth certificate's worth a lot of money. The bankers are issuing bonds against it from the day you were born and making billions. You have earned billions for the bankers. Billions. Have a look at Tim Turner. Tim Turner on YouTube, America can be free. And you will learn how he is bringing down the court system in America, probably single-handedly. Big, 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 big suing, big cases. We're going to catch these bastards. The private guild have been running the Vatican's trust system for since the Knights Templars in, from about the 1500s. They have been running this system. So when you go to court, you actually front up to the priest. It's ecclesiastical. It's the Inquisition. The summons is an indulgence. You're going there to pay an indulgence. You're going there for a court hearing. Father, I have confessed because they're managing your account because you're a ward of the state. You handed in your birth certificate. Yeah. Well, we do that to our children too. I did that to my son. But now I know. But you can collapse these trusts. There's a guy called Franco Collins in Australia. Check out his stuff. I'm promoting his stuff. And I'm doing seminars also on law, teaching us how we've been enslaved and how we can get out of it. Because every time you get a fine, a utility, everything, it's been charged already to your trust. When you pay, you go to the post office and you pull out wads of cash to pay for your electricity bill, it's already been paid for. Everything's prepaid. It's all prepaid. You're not sp it, they give you a statement for your utilities, not an invoice. It's just a statement telling you, we've already dipped into your, we've got your numbers you signed with us, we've got your numbers, we've dipped into your trust, it's been paid for, here's a statement. And you go to the post office and give them more money. We've been enslaved, we've been duped in a big, big way. But it's more important that we focus on this because this will show you the biggest lie that was ever told. Not that one, that's the second biggest. The biggest one is about the Jesus history story. It's a big lie. It's a whopper. But the bigger you tell them, the more the stupid ones will fall. They'll fall. And they're going to their churches in droves, learning about a historical Jesus who's going to appear one day and save them. It's impossible. We are responsible for our own salvation through the course of love and consciousness and truth. We speak truth to one another. We verify things. We prove things. We are scientists and philosophers, lovers of wisdom. We don't go down their path. You see how people, when they get in a uniform, like a policeman, you see how they act and they're tough and they're over and above you and, and they're going to indict you and, they're gonna, and, and they've got, I've got tasers and I've got guns. This is, this is just a, this is barbaric. This world is barbaric how we've 
come and we've allowed these police officers to walk our streets. It, they're just a corporation. Vic Rose is a corporation registered on the S Securities Stock Exchange Commission in New York to rub it in your nose. Not even in Australia. It's all of it. The Commonwealth of Australia, Vic Rhodes, all of these corporations are all registered in New York. The They're parties. traders. Look at the time they have. Everything. Political parties. All of them. That's all it is. But this exposes them. First you get to the biggest lie and then you deal with the second biggest lie and all the ones thereafter. This is big exposure. There's a shaft running out there, there's a shaft there, there's a shaft there, there's a shaft there. The four air shafts of the pyramid, okay? This is south, this is north. These stars point to Draco in the north. Aren't all those blocked? Yeah, they're all blocked. Aren't those doors the ones that go out? All, all of them. They're all blocked. They're all blocked around here. This is the Gutenberg one where they sent that little... Uh, this is the interesting one because this points to Sirius. It always has, it always will. Because Sirius does not precess. Remember those stars that precess every 72 years? Sirius is always there. Is that the pole star? No, that's the pole star. Polaris is over in Draco. Not in Draco, but... The pole star doesn't precess. North and south. Yes, well the pole star, there's no star at, at, at perfect north. Po Polaris is here and then there's seven other stars in the north, that all, see what happens is um, the North Pole, it's hard to explain but all these, all these seven, there are seven stars in the very, very northern hemisphere and Polaris is sitting closest now to true north. So Polaris is the pole star only for 2,000 years, right? Then it will go to uh, stars like um, there's a couple in this Alpha Draco and Beta Draco and there's a few more, but there are seven. And these, believe it or not, are more spoken of in prophecy than you, you, than you would believe. You know the prophecy where it says, and the, the woman um, was holding her son to seat him on the throne, talking about Jesus and Mary, because Jesus is supposed to be ruling now for 2,000 years, the Christian age, right, Pisces? Well, it's all about this. Polaris, Polaris is the sun because Ursa Major, there are seven constellations here, remember. One of them is Ursa Major and the other one which has Polaris in it is Ursa Minor, the small bear. And, and she's sometimes depicted as a hippopotamus holding her baby, Polaris, because she wants to put her son on the throne. But he only gets 2,000 years. Draco, he gets 6,000 years on the throne. Draco's a bigger constellation. There they are. They're the northern stars. And Polaris right now is the closest to the north. And he always gets to sit on the throne in the age of Pisces and Aquarius. So when Aquarius comes, that's what it means that Jesus, the sun, will rule for a thousand years. Because he's got one more thousand years and then he, he gets knocked off by the next star. And when those stars line up, to Polaris, when, when they actually get to go on the throne, there's certain conditions. There's the Golden Age when one of these constellations is on the throne. There's the Iron Age when, when the Lord Polaris gets on the throne. Pay, um, try to remember that because this is how prophecy works. It's all about the stars. And when, they, when the stars fall from heaven, it means they've fallen out of their original place. They've shifted, they've moved because they're always monitoring this sky above. Because in the sky above, as you will see, are all the fairy tales, our agricultural year is there, our body is there. there. The man Adam in the sky is there. If you, um, there it is. Starting with Aries at the head, Taurus, Gemini, there's the twins, Gemini, the arms, Pollux and Castor, the right hand. Cancer is the chest, corresponds with the chest. Leo is the heart, Virgo is the belly, Libra is the kidneys, Scorpio is the generative organs, Sagittarius is the thighs, Capricorn, knees, Aquarius and Pisces are the feet. Now this is a big, big story. That the man, starting from Aries, Aries in the head, Taurus, 
Gemini, the two lungs and the two arms, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, is all there. So when you go to a healer and he sees your, your birth chart and he knows, notices that you've got an opposition to, let's say, to Virgo, well, he knows that you're going to have some trouble with your intestines. You'll have some bowel problems for the rest of your life. So you need to have crystals. I don't have my crystals with me today because I came plain, but I like to usually wear crystals because I have an affliction in Virgo. And I've always had intestinal or stomach discomfort because it's there. It's in your birth chart. You get headaches, you've got an affliction to your head, to Aries. Check your birth chart. If you've got kidney problems, I've often, uh, I do birth charts for many people, many friends, and sometimes strangers, because I like to tell them what's going on in their body. And I look at their birth chart and I see the afflictions. And I, the other day, just the other day, I said to uh, an Indian man, I said, um, you, you're going to have to watch your kidneys, because there's an affliction there. And he looked at me and he w went white. And he said, I've had, um, I've had severe problems with my kidneys all my life. And I said, well, it's there. There it is. That's the line going to your kidneys. You can heal yourself for free if you know this science. But Big Pharma doesn't want that. You know how much they make from cancer? $800,000. Please accept chemotherapy. Please, it's the best that's out there. Oh, just do it. How do they get $800,000? Through your trust. Everything is charged to your trust. They're making so much money from us. That's how it happens. All righty, so let's get into a, a, just a couple more reasons and, and proofs that we're in a binary. Because we've already discussed the fact that Venus, uh, Sirius has turned blue. This shaft here is always pointing to Sirius. It doesn't process. He mentions it here, mentions all of the proofs that I'm going to give you. Uh, let's go for some more proofs. Um, January the 1st. Every January the 1st, there is an alignment. Guess what that alignment is? Sirius, the Earth, and the Sun. In fact, on January the 1st, when we're out there at South Bank watching all those uh, firecrackers and, and the display, what people fail to notice if they look straight above, almost straight above, and you should do this at 1 o'clock because we have daylight saving, and normally it'd be 12 o'clock, but do it at 1, right? Next January the 1st. Just look up and you'll see Sirius. Midnight. And below your feet is the sun. It's midnight, so the sun's below your feet and directly above is Sirius. And in between must be the earth because you're standing on it. So this alignment proves that we're in a binary. We live, we're in an elliptical orbit around the sun. There's, let's say, let's put the sun here. So when we orbit the sun, it's not like this. It's not in the middle and it's not a pure circle. It's a bit like that. This point here is January the 1st. Let's just exaggerate it a little bit. That's January the 1st, guys. Interesting? That's why it's the first day of the year. It's got nothing to do with our sun. If you're going to make the first day of the year based on our solar system alone, it would have to be either December the 21st, March the 21st, June the 21st, or September the 21st. It has to be either an equinox or a solstice. It can't be January the 1st. January the 1st doesn't make sense at all. But it does when you know that it, this is perihelion. Apohelion is when it's over it's when it's over here on June uh, I'm sorry in around June July so January the 1st is perihelion helion is the sun closest to the sun furthest away from the sun right uh, another expression might be um, what's the other expression that's used more generally when when you have the closest to um, Oh God, this, oh, it'll come to me. But, but when we're dealing with the sun and when our, the planets are actually closest to it, we use this expression, perihelion. Now, what else is happening at that? I told you that it's 
um, our sun is actually lined up with Sirius. So let's put Sirius there. That's what's happening. There's our Earth. This is January the 1st, every year. Notice anything interesting about that? Well, well, if, sorry, let's do this. Um, no, let's, let's do it like this. I'm sorry, I've confused you. I should have done it like this. Let's put that orbit over here. Yeah, that's better. There's the Earth there. Sorry. Okay. No wonder I didn't get any responses because now it's obvious. Have a look at that. That's January the 1st, perihelion, and we're lined up with Sirius. You can, see, can, you, can you see the drag on the orbit? Can you see it's like, it's obvious that this, this guy, in fact, I could put it here, really. I could put it uh, like this, like that, and make more sense and put Sirius over here. These guys are getting sucked into each other so fast, they're, they're travelling toward each other so fast that this is going on. And that's why you've got January the 1st here. That's a proof that we're in a binary with Sirius. Why would Sirius be directly above and the Sun below your feet on January the 1st every year? Check it out. What about another proof? Okay, time deltas. Here's another proof that we're in a binary with Sirius. Um, our, moon <coughs> our moon goes around the Earth every 29.49 days, our moon. But the phases are only 27 days point two. So you've got 27 days for the, uh, the uh, synodic, synodic moon 27 days for the synodic moon, so the phases of the, of the moon, okay? And it's 29 days, point 0.4, for the, um, whoopsie, I got that the wrong way around. It's the other way around. This goes down here. All right, so every 29.5 days, we see quarter moon, full moon, quarter moon, new moon. But it only takes 27 days for the moon to go right around the Earth. So there's a delta of 2.2 days. It's a delta. A delta is like a slice in the pie. There's 2.2 days difference between the two moon cycles. This is where people get confused with the moon. And there's a few other cycles in there, but we'll just stick with these two ones now, right? The synodic and the actual sidereal orbit of the moon. Let me explain how it works. It's quite simple. So, there's our sun, and here we are orbiting around the sun, and there's the earth, nice and green, and we have a moon that orbits anti-clockwise around our anti-clockwise rotating earth. Right? Now, that moon, from that point to there, it will get to there in... 27 days, it'll go around in 27 days, 27.2 days. But because our Earth is moving, in around about 30 days it'll be there. Okay, because it's moved from here to here and it's going to, every 30 days it'll have clocked the orbit, right? It's gone around the orbit, okay, so 12 months of the year. So it's moved from there to there. So, and it's curving everything is curving around the sun. So that explains that, that time delta. Because our moon, our moon wants to go around, around the earth, right? So what it does is the earth is moving while it's, it's going around. It's moving and moving and moving. By the time it starts from here and gets back to that point, it will have to get back to that point over there. And it's moved 30 degrees. Right? And that, take, that going around takes 27 days. But the phases are lagging behind by 2.2 days. Because it had to, it, 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 that's the 2.2 two days from there to there. Because it's moving, it's a moving target. 
So it's got to catch up. So the phases, finally the last phase, catches up with the moon from here to there. Okay? If No. Yes. Yes. No, it's not that. Um, so, um, I, I'm using that analogy of the time delta because we're, we're so familiar with that. We know about this. I mean, have you cl um, cleared that up in your mind before or is, is it now clear now about the time delta? Did you realise that the phase and the actual orbit were 2.2 days different? There you go. You see how valuable this information is about our solar system? And when you know that, then you realise that our every year we're also losing 20 minutes. We lose 20 minutes. There's a time delta of 20 minutes with respect to our sun and the earth going around it, just like the moon going around our earth. The relationship between here and here, there's also a time delta. It's a little bit more difficult to explain. But if you get the book... And I do recommend you read this book because he's gone back and he loves this guy, loves him, right? And he loves all those myths. That's why he's called this the lost star of myth and time. We've, we have lost, we have suffered in our knowledge of this binary. It's our problem. The time delta works like this because our sun is curving around Sirius there has to be a time delta. I'll keep it simple. That's all I'm going to say. You can learn how the time delta is there. It's a 20-minute time delta. Now, that's enough of the proofs. There's a couple more. There's the thing called shear edge. Our solar system, if that's the sun and these are all the planets going around it, and then there's the asteroid belt out here going around, and, and there's, there's a lot of stuff. There's the Oort cloud and the um, Kuiper belt. And... All of a sudden, it, it ends. There's a sheer edge. It just stops. No asteroids, no rocks, no nothing. Just beautiful, clean air. And this is way outside of our solar system, like about a 40 or 50 astronomical units. We're talking 40 or 50 astronomical units. Remember, an astronomical unit is 93 million miles. So at 40 or 50 astronomical units, there's a sheer edge. There's nothing. These are all rocks and everything like that. And this is our, just our solar system there, right? And then you go out into the Kuiper belt and then there's a sheer edge. Well, because obviously we're rotating around another star which also has a sheer edge. And when those asteroids and everything come close to each other, they repel each other and keep them in, in a body which is called a solar system. That's what it is. That's another proof that we're in a solar uh, a binary with Sirius. And there's a few more which I won't go into because I want to get into the juicy stuff. It's coming. All right? Now, bef so we've got a good grasp of the solar system now. All right? We know a little bit more than we did two hours ago, okay? There's more to learn, but it doesn't matter. That's, we'll, um, we'll, keep it, we'll keep it simple. The day and the year, all of the cycles that we live in are attributed to the timekeepers. I showed you how the moon comes from month. Year comes from, yes, the sun. So... We have established that all our cycles, these boys and girls, these are the Elohim. Venus is a girl. Mercury is a girl. Mercury is a girl. It's a hermaphrodite. The moon is a girl. He's a boy. He's a boy. He's a boy. He's a, and, and he's a boy, Mars. These are the only solid bodies in the solar system. These are all gas. These are gas giants, Uranus and Neptune, Pluto. Gas, gas, solid. Boy, boy, boy. So this, you've got Thor, Woden, the one-eyed Woden. Zeus is always one-eyed. And he's the god of thunder. Why? Well, have a look at the, um, the Voyager images of Jupiter and look at the surface and it's just chaos. It's electric chaos. It is an electric storm. There's billions of, of storms going on around its atmosphere all the time. They knew... They knew it was the God of Thunder, because it is. He represents ether. He's the one that brings in the ether into our solar system. This one brings in the fire, the hydrogen. This is the fire guy. And the air is Venus. 
and the water is the moon, and the earth is Saturn. All of those planets are bringing in those four. They all harmonize with this. In fact, everything does. Your bodies do. Everything harmonizes with the seven, Elohim, or the twelve, the twelve potential energies. For instance, I'm an Arian, Aries. I have, I have cardinal fire. So I resonate with the fire energy. All right, you Cancerians, water. And Carl Jung taught us that these are the intuitives, the thinkers, the emotional and the five sense people. If you're a Capricorn or a Virgo or a Taurian, you will, you will be most served by your five senses in this world. Touch things, see things, smell things. It's a pleasure to watch a Taurian eating, watching TV, sitting on his leather couch, you know. It's a pleasure. They're just so different to my people. We don't, we don't pay much attention to that, that sort of stuff. It doesn't matter. It's just a different modes, different styles. These people, my brother is a Scorpio. Uh, and the emotions, you think I'm emotional. Um, there are, it's a pleasure to watch a Piscean, mutable water, or a, um, a Scorpio, fixed water, or Cancer with the moon especially females, Cancerians, their emotions, it's just beautiful, it's exquisite. That's if their emotions are balanced. If they're unbalanced, you know, you Cancerians <laughs> and Scorpios, you know, they're a handful. And the air people, my son's Libran, it's busy eyes. Aquarians, busy eyes. Because, why? Because they're, they're, they're mind. These are the mind people, the spirit people. This is the sign of the man. You look at the air signs and you've got a scale with a man in it. You've got the two Geminis, that's two humans. And you've got Aquarius, the water bearer. All the others are animals. These are human. It's mind. They are great thinkers. Aquarian geniuses. Great thinkers, Librans, balanced, balanced minds. And your Geminis, <whistles> two minds, believe me, there's two minds. There are two minds. These guys are the intuitives. Their intuition is what gets them through. And that's from Carl Jung, okay? We'll spend some more time on that later. And uh, I also want to show you that... Um, the signs manifest body types and facial types. You look at your Leos, um, there's your um, Geminis. One eye goes one way, one eye goes the other way, like a bung eye. They've got the skewed facial look because they've got two faces, haven't they? <laughs> yeah, it's a, I love it. I can pick Geminis straight away. Just You can see that sort of... <laughs> hold, it hold it up. There's your Geminis. JFK, uh, who we got here, Clint Eastwood, Marilyn Monroe, Paul McCartney. There's your Leos, feline features, they've got the feline eyes. Or they've got the lion's mane, big mane. You can see the features. Ah, uh, yes. Well, <coughs> we're going to do that. We're going to do that. It's all going to come out in this graph that I'm going to do right now. We'll get into the astrology. Astrology is very, very, very important. Very, very sacred, sacred science. I just want to share with you how Marcus Manilius introduced his book. I love reading this. It's worth reading. Marcus Manilius, the astronomer to Caesar Augustus. And if you read this poem, I promise you, you will understand everything that I'm going to do today because I learnt most of my stuff from these ancient astronomers. You've got to read Ptolemy. You have to read Firmicus Maternus. <laughs> and you've got to read Marcus Manilius, Aratus, Plato, Hermes. Most important. <clears throat> You, God of Selene, that's Mercury, Selene's the moon, 
are the first founder of this great and holy science. Through you has man gained a deeper knowledge of the sky, the constellations, the names and courses of the signs, their importance and influences, and the aspect of the firmament that the aspect of the firmament, firmament might be enhanced, that all might be roused not only to, by the appearance, but by the power of things. It's pretty powerful. And that mankind might learn wherein lay God's greatest power. And believe me, when you learn this science, you will be doing one great favour to yourself. You will know yourself. And as the oracle of Delphi said, man, know thyself and you will know the gods of the heavens and, uh, the heavens and the gods that rule them. That's the knowledge that they have been fighting against, the theologians. They've been fighting this and telling us that it's poo-poo. Who tells you that astrology is poo-poo? There's only two classes of people, the clergy and the fools who believe them. I see that all the time. Christians that go to church and have been indoctrinated, astrologers from the devil, and as soon as you say something like, what's your star sign? You ask them what their star sign is, they say, oh, I don't believe in that bullshit. And then I say, well, how much do you know about it? What do you know? Nothing. It's just bullshit. Because they've been told it's bullshit. And who by? The pedophile priests who don't want you to grow and know thyself. They want you to know their God. Their fiction, the one that they've invented, their personal creator, who's called the Jehovah's Witnesses tell you that, you, you know, um, <clears throat> their, their God uh, expects you to go around witnessing. I know, I was a Jehovah's Witness for 20 years. And you, you go knocking on people's doors because you have to go knocking on people's doors. But the Mormons say that their God won't let you drink coffee because you go to hell. And, th and then the Seventh-day Adventists say, you know, they're making it up as they go. <laughs> when you learn the science, then you know God. 